Hello, I'm Dr. Tedrin Blair Lindsay. I'm a musicologist, vocal coach, and musical director on the faculty of UK Opera Theatre. For 17 years, I have been teaching a class called Opera 101. I've tried to get people to call it the Opera Lex Lecture Series, but Opera 101 has stuck. And uh, this serves Opera Lex and the community in getting to know this wonderful art form, opera, in support of UK Opera Theatre. And uh, the whole thing was a brainchild of Dr. Michael Morrill, a longtime uh, supporter of UK Opera. And he and Louise Schaus, another longtime supporter, suggested that for this new format, I start back at the beginning and uh, share some of the basics of opera that they were privy to nigh on two decades ago. And now you can catch up and get to know uh, some things about this wonderful art form of opera. And so uh, welcome to the class. It's very unusual because here we are in a global pandemic, which has finally allowed us to move to an online format where people don't have to just enjoy it on Saturday mornings, as it's traditionally been held, but now can enjoy it both on Saturday mornings and whenever you want to. So welcome to the class. Let's get started. The basics of opera are it's about singing. And there are several different types of singing voices. There are the very highest women's voices, sopranos. Then there are mezzo-sopranos, that means half a soprano. And contralto, which actually means against the high part. Those are the lower women's voices. Then there are tenors and baritones and basses. And then there are also men who sing in an alto or even a soprano register, and they're called countertenors. So over the next six weeks, we're going to explore all of these different voice types. And I hope you'll learn something about uh, those types and uh, what to listen for and what to expect from them, as well as getting to know some of my personal favorite singers in the examples that I've selected to share with you from scouring YouTube for some very fascinating video performances by divas and divos alike. This week and next week, we're going to talk about sopranos, the high voices. And there are a couple of words that you should know in talking about uh, any voice type, really. Uh, the first word is tessitura. Say that with me, tessitura. And uh, what that means is where the vocal line sits. Does it sit high or does it sit low? And so within a soprano piece, a soprano might talk about it having a very high tessitura, meaning that it sits high the whole time, or a me medium tessitura with excursions to the high points. You'll hear examples of both of those in the examples today and next week, because it's going to take us two weeks to explore all the sopranos. So tessitura means the vocal range of a piece or of a voice. Uh, now, voices range from uh, a very light sound, which we call lyric, uh, a creamy, sustained tone, to uh, we think of it as a heavier tone. What it is is a bigger, rounder, fuller tone, and we call that dramatic. So, uh, sopranos can range from the very most lyric, the kind that sing made parts, and we call them soubrettes, to light lyric sopranos, lyric sopranos, full lyric. And then we have dramatic sopranos of various kinds. Uh, we uh, sometimes will call them uh, Verdi sopranos, if they're the kind that sing Verdi really well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Or even Wagnerian sopranos. They don't necessarily come wearing Viking helmets, but those are the kind we're talking about. So from very light voices to very heavy voices, uh, so to speak, uh, ranging lyric to dramatic. Uh, now then, another word you need to know is coloratura. Say that with me, coloratura. And what that means is fancy, showy passage work. Uh, and when we talk about a coloratura soprano, we usually mean someone who sings uh, very flashy, ornamented stuff high up in the range, and it's very exciting. And uh, actually, there can be lyric coloratura voices and dramatic coloratura voices. 
we're about to hear a dramatic coloratura voice just to get us started. This is one of the most famous soprano arias ever written, and one of the reasons it's famous is because it also demands the soprano to sing a number of high Fs. This is the Queen of the Night's Revenge aria from Act Two of Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, the magic flute. And this soprano is a contemporary artist, uh, one of the greatest coloratura sopranos, though, of all time. This is the great Diana Damrau. Please enjoy. <laughs> Isn't that an astonishing performance? That's why we love opera, being able to see someone and hear someone actually do that live in a fantastical costume on a stage. Imagine those sounds coming out of your mouth. Oh, I can't imagine them coming out of mine either. I love getting to be around singers and hearing that all the time. So after all of that discussion of lyric and dramatic sopranos, let's explore that a little bit further with a great example of both. First, let's hear a lyric soprano. This is one of the greatest ever. Uh, really, she is a light lyric soprano uh, who sang some soubrette roles and had a magnificent coloratura facility, a little bit of which you'll hear in this. It's from the same opera, The Magic Flute, but this is the legendary Kathleen Battle singing Ach ich fühls, in which uh, Pamina thinks that her beloved Tamino is rejecting her. Now, not only listen to the beautiful lyric soprano outpouring of grief, but notice what a stunning actress she was.
Many opera lovers would say that the greatest dramatic soprano of all time was the Swedish singer Birgit Nilsson. She was the epitome of a Wagnerian soprano and made her living singing these big, huge roles with her voice that was like a cross between a trumpet and a laser beam. It just shot across the orchestra uh, and sometimes even drowning out the whole 80-piece Wagnerian band. Just incredible. Uh, I had a fun time finding some of these videos, including this one especially. This is a really campy 60s television performance of the end of Wagner's Ring Cycle, uh, Brunhilde's immolation scene when she's setting herself on fire to save the world, uh, from Wagner's Götterdämmerung. Please just go ahead and drop your jaws before listening to Birgit Nilsson singing the end of the Ring Cycle. Wasn't that astounding? I guess it, it's easy to see, though, the difference between a big dramatic voice like Birgit Nilsson's and a much lighter lyric voice like Kathleen Battles. Most voices, uh, most soprano voices, are somewhere between those two extremes, including the legendary singer we're about to hear. This is the great black soprano Leontine Price, who was one of the leading stars at the Metropolitan Opera from the 60s through the early 80s. Um, she specialized in roles by Giuseppe Verdi. And in order to sing Verdi, a soprano, whether lyric or dramatic, has to have a certain quality called spinto. Say that with me, spinto. Very good. What that means is literally in Italian, thrust is what the word spinto means. And in a voice, it means that there's this uh, projecting quality to the voice that allows it to ride above the orchestra, maybe not like a laser beam like Birgit Nilsson's, but still to project above the orchestral sound uh, as if riding on the air in front of all the rest of the instruments. Uh, you'll hear that in this performance of Verdi's Tacea la Notte Placida from Il Trovatore. In this aria, uh, 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 Leonora is singing about a troubadour that she heard serenading her at night and fell in love with the sound of his voice. This uh, piece is uh, an aria. An aria is what we usually call a solo song in an opera. 
And uh, it, this aria, like many, is divided into two sections. A slow lyrical part called a cavatina. Say that with me. Cavatina. Very good. And that's followed by a fast, exciting section called a cabaletta. Say that with me. Cabaletta. So please enjoy hearing the spinto thrust of this sort of medium-sized uh, voice, somewhere between lyric and dramatic, but with so much spinto that you can hear her easily and expressively over the orchestra. This is another of those uh, sort of campy 60s TV performances. So enjoy Leontine Price at her prime. Price sings Touche alla notte, in which she tells of the fidelity of her love for the troubadour who has entered her life so mysteriously. Oh, no. 
It's easy to see, isn't it, why Leontine Price is one of the greatest divas of all time. Diva is an interesting word and concept. It means godlike. Uh, a diva is a female god. And uh, we get the English word divine from the Italian and Latin roots of that word. And uh, the masculine form of that is a divo, but usually we refer to divas and what we mean are sopranos. And it's not that all of them are either ill-tempered or vain or self-seeking. Uh, many of us are, and we're not even singers. <laughs> but uh, divas uh, are these great singers who have sort of a persona that's larger than life. And most of these great singers that we're talking about uh, can be considered great divas. And not in a negative sense at all, but in a sense of almost worshiping them for what they've brought to the art form. Not in a sacrilegious way, but in a way of uh, understanding the sublime art that they create for us. Uh, two of the greatest divas of all time were involved in a rivalry not of their own making. Uh, the divas I'm talking about are the beautiful Italian soprano Renata Tebaldi and the uh, Greek-American soprano of great note, Maria Callas. Uh, Callas is widely considered to be perhaps the greatest opera singer of all time, uh, although she certainly did not have the most beautiful voice of all time. Uh, she was a magnificent musician and a great singing actress. Tebaldi, on the other hand, had one of the most glorious voices you'll ever hear and was a fairly wooden and stodgy actress. And uh, nevertheless, the glorious uh, singing that she brought to the stage and a sympathetic demeanor on stage. Uh, I'm not saying that she just was unstage worthy, but no actress. And so um, uh, audiences wanted to hear the beautiful singing and they wanted to marvel at the great singing actress. And they both were uh, at their height at the same time, the 50s and 60s. Well, the impresario of the Metropolitan Opera, Sir Rudolph Bing, who uh, has been uh, uh, noted as someone who liked to cause some trouble amongst his singers, uh, did start a rivalry between Callas and Tibaldi, uh, basically playing them off one another in terms of who had opening nights in certain seasons, who got to sing uh, which roles in certain seasons, who got which tenors to partner with in certain seasons, and even how much salary they would make. And he played them off one another, and this uh, rivalry grew, and Renata had the... Uh, uh, sweet, innocent, wounded demeanor. And Maria Callas was the fiery one who uh, always seemed to be perturbed that Tebaldi would encroach upon her queendom. At least that's how it played out in the press and somewhat between the two of them. Anyway, they were both worthy divas and uh, were great in numbers of roles. But one of the roles they shared and which Bing played them off against each other in was the role of Tosca in Puccini's opera of the same name. And my favorite soprano aria 
is from act two of that opera. It's called Visi d'Arte. And in this uh, aria, Tosca is pleading with God for uh, some understanding. She says, I've done everything I could do to be a good, uh, righteous person, although she's living in sin with the painter and is about to commit murder. But nevertheless, she's praying. And uh, she says, why are you repaying my piety this way? in an aria that I know you'll recognize. So just for fun, it's fairly short. I want you to hear for yourself the difference between the glorious singing and the stodgy acting of Renata Tebaldi, and then we'll follow it immediately with a uh, performance by Maria Callas singing the same aria and singing it beautifully, but it's much more about the acting and the character than it is about the beauty of the singing itself. You'll understand what I mean when you hear them. Please enjoy Tebaldi and Callas and start your own rivalry.
So you can see what I mean from Renata sitting there on the chaise long singing the song beautifully and Maria Callas just practically tearing the lens out of the camera as she acts her face off singing the song also beautifully. Maria Callas, though, was uh, more renowned for being a crossover singer in, of a certain kind. Not only could she sing long Puccini lines like that, but she was famous as a coloratura soprano in all of the bel canto repertoire, that uh, flashy coloratura stuff written by composers like Rossini and Bellini and Donizetti. And so not only was she sort of in rivalry with people like Renata Tebaldi, but she was in rivalry with other divas who were uh, sort of ensconced in the coloratura land, like the great Joan Sutherland. Joan Sutherland also was a fairly stodgy actress and uh, has been denigrated sometimes for singing in what we can call a univowel. Uh, her diction is not the best, and if you're listening for the words, that's not what you're going to get out of Joan Sutherland very much. What you're going to get is beautiful, creamy tone in astonishing, high-flying coloratura. And because Joan's voice was so much more effulgently pretty than Maria Callas's, they were rivals in the coloratura repertoire. Uh, for now, we're not going to hear Maria singing coloratura. You can, you can just guess how she attacks that as aggressively as she attacks a lyric line like Tosca. But I do want you to hear Joan Sutherland. This is another of those TV staged uh, pieces where she sings, apparently for the first time since it was discovered by her husband, the conductor Richard Bonning, the uh, fiery end to the opera I Puritani by Bellini. Uh, and uh, uh, you will hear uh, just how astonishing Joan Sutherland is in letting loose this stream of high notes. In act three, the lovers are reunited and Elvira sings Arsento O Mio Bellangelo. This final aria was considered too difficult to perform and long ago was deleted from the opera and forgotten. But the original manuscript in Bellini's hand was recently rediscovered in Sicily by Richard Bonning, Miss Sutherland's husband. And now for the first time, the aria will be performed on television. So that's Joan Sutherland. Wow. Yes, we love hearing that. That's just technically perfect singing. 
and uh, she certainly had her share of stage presence, but you see what I mean. That's not acting, that's just sort of swooping around. <laughs> uh, so the Maria Callas fans would denigrate Joan Sutherland uh, for being that way. Another of the great coloratura uh, and lyric sopranos of uh, their generation was a Spanish woman named Montserrat Caballé, and I wish we had time to hear something by her. Uh, she was also in the same vein as Joan Sutherland, though, a beautiful voice capable of high-flying coloratura. But if there was a true rival to Sutherland and Callas in the coloratura realm, it was the American soprano Beverly Sills, who also happens to be probably my personal favorite soprano. Beverly Sills uh, could really sing anything as long as it was in a high enough tessitura. She was well known for French opera, for singing Handel, for singing American opera, and uh, certainly for singing uh, these uh, coloratura pieces, such as the uh, masterpiece you're about to hear. This is the famous aria Sempre Libera from the end of Act I of La Traviata, uh, in which uh, the courtesan Violetta having been thinking about maybe falling in love with a guy that she met, decides no, she must continue living her life for pleasure, that's all she's ever known, and that's what she's good at, and to live any other way would be folly. Not only can you hear that in Verdi's delicious music to this aria, but you can hear it in Beverly Sills' performance. What I love about Beverly Sills over Maria Callas and Joan Sutherland is that, like Maria Callas, she was an effective actress, who really invested herself in not only the text, but uh, the text of the music and making them combine for a real dramatic purpose, and yet had a gorgeous voice uh, capable of great high-flying coloratura, just like uh, Joan Sutherland. Uh, maybe her voice was on the lighter side than Joan's. Joan's is creamy. Beverly's was more like silver, as you'll hear. Uh, in this great rendition. Again, another st uh, studio recording. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that is my girl, Beverly Sills, and I know that you uh, must love her now too. All of the ladies we've heard today have been recorded uh, through the ages, and you can easily find uh, them on social media as well. So listen to your heart's content to these wonderful sopranos. Next week, we're going to continue uh, with uh, something maybe a little less about some terms and uh, basics of opera. I basically just want to share with you some of my very favorite sopranos in uh, pieces that I think they do sublimely. So I will see you next week at the same time. But if you want to listen to this whole talk and these singers again, uh, this will stay up on our YouTube channel of UK Opera Theatre. Thank you for attending, and we'll see you next week.